Now let me turn it over to Allen Ginsberg. Thank you. So I wanted also to re-emphasize this evening at 8, uh, following the Venerable William Burroughs' reading, there'll be a uh, lecture by the Venerable Edo Roshi up at Sacred Heart, a uh, real live Zen master, just like a real live Western genius. And uh, I think it's Monday evening uh, at 8, Chogyam Trungpa uh, Rinpoche, also poet, will be speaking at Sacred Heart. And then on Wednesday at 5, is it? Uh, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche will be speaking in this hall. So you have a series of uh, amazing heads addressing you. If you're smart enough to pick up on them, beginning now. Uh, William Burroughs, at the present age of uh, 71, has been teaching at Naropa steadily every summer. Uh, maybe one exception, but I'm not sure. I don't think any were missed since he was 60 years old, which is 11 years. Uh, one of our first adjunct uh, instructors uh, in, in the poetics department, and he has been uh, faithfully helping us out in uniting the poetic community and inspiring the younger students here, as all over America and all over the world, with his intelligence and his insight, prajna, wisdom, and uh, cutting through humor. Uh, at the moment, the uh, bound proof copies of an antique manuscript from 1953 uh, called Queer is circulating among reviewers with a 1984-85 introduction by Mr. Burroughs occupying about a third of the uh, space of the book linking his thought of 1953 and his thought and emotion of 1985. So that will be the next book published He's also working on uh, a long-range novel, the end of his trilogy, uh, Cities of the Red Knight, Place of Dead Roads. So the third volume, which I think the first draft of which is almost done, is The Western Lands, uh, part of a long-range writing project that's occupied, I guess, the last 10 years. Uh, very few writers have that much patience and devotion and uh, uh, energy with their work. Certainly I don't. Uh, and not many prose writers even have that sense of long range composition. But Mr. Burroughs has pursued his subject which is control and consciousness, uh, examination of basic good for the last 40 years as I remember and is now at the height of his powers not only with the new manuscript Queer, the new novel sequel The Western Lands, but also a very acute, curious book on called Cat Inside. Mr. Burroughs has six cats in Lawrence, Kansas, upon all of whom he projects his imagination and is like his uh, T.S. Eliot St. Louis compere, also uh, interested in cats as a uh, medium between himself and the public. And so there's a big cat book, the manuscript of which Mr. Burroughs has here. So he'll be reading from The Cat Inside, The Western Lands, and other notes. So we'll have all new, fresh intelligence from William Seward Burroughs. Thank you. I'd like to pass along a flatly insane uh, recent uh, news story. A man swimming in a canal in Florida attacked two alligators with his fists, screaming at the sanities. The alligators dragged him down and drowned him. 
and the sheriff's office said no attempt would be made to locate or sanction the alligators. That, uh, I guess he got what he was looking for. <coughs> Uh, how many of you have read my novel, The Place of Dead Rose? Good. Excellent. And <laughs> uh, you will remember that uh, Kim Carson and Mike Chase get greased in the end. Not that they're likely to stay dead in this league of operatives. Dying is like trading in your old car. Time for new chances. <coughs> Now, I just uh, wonder how many of you figured out who killed them. Yes? Uh, it has to be someone I didn't tell because I told quite a few people here. Uh, did I tell you? Well, uh, no, that's not fair then. No, it has to be someone uh, that I didn't give the answer to. Huh. Looks like I really wrote a whodunit. So, but obviously, in a whodunit, the obvious suspects are not the ones. It wasn't Pickford's agents at all. And the clues should be found on, one, on page 126. Uh, Kim was aware of the danger from Joe the Dead, thought he could handle it. Famous last thoughts. <clears throat> uh, Joe says, here I am, the best technician in or out of hell, and he brings me back from hell to make slingshots and scout knives and zip guns. Yeah, leave the details to Joe. He left one too many. Joe laughs, a dry, rustling sound like a snake shedding its skin. I lifted that out of a spy novel. Good enough to steal. Joe the Dead belongs to a select breed of outlaws known as no's. Natural outlaws dedicated to breaking the so-called natural laws of the universe, foisted on us by physicists, chemists, mathematicians, and biologists, and above all, the monumental fraud of cause and effect. To be replaced with the more fruitful concept of synchronicity, why, well, you could it even fits right into a song. It must be the madam, synchronicity. Ordinary outlaws break man-made laws. Laws against theft and murder, of course, are broken every second. You only break a natural law once. To the ordinary criminal, breaking a law is a means to an end, to obtaining money, removing an obstruction. To the no, Breaking a natural law is an end, uh, the end of that law. Ordinary outlaws specialize in accordance with inclination and aptitude, or they did. Many of them are on the endangered species list, with the gliding lemmers, the rusty spotted cat, and the monkey-eating eagle. Well, the monkey-eating eagle will not be missed by the monkeys. <laughs> Consider the Murphy Man. How many of you know what a Murphy Man is? Not one. Your Murphy Man steers a mark to a non-existent whore. Having located an apartment building without a doorman with the front door open. It's uh, mostly a black art. Only a black man has the Murphy man voice, cool, insinuating, familiar, and the Murphy man face. Sincere, unflappable, untrustworthy. He spots a mark from out of town, away from wife and kids for a night on the town. Looking for some action, friend? Uh, well, uh, yes. Uh, the Murphy man makes a phone call. It's all set up. He leads the mark to this apartment. Go up one flight, first door on your left. 1A prime grade, friend. And she's ready and waiting. He gives her a big, toothy smile. I wonder if there are any Murphy men left. And then there was the uh, practitioners of the hype or the bill. It's the short change routine. You start with $20. You get the change on the counter, and then 
oh, wait a minute, I don't want to take all your change. Give me 10 and counts it back minus the 10. It's hard to get a conviction because nobody can explain exactly what happened. <laughs> I've had it explained to me many, many times, and I still don't see how it works. But the basic principle can be found in a sketch by Edgar Allan Poe on 19th century hustlers who were known as diddlers. Now the diddler walks into a tobacco store and asks for a plug of tobacco. When the plug is on the counter, he changes his mind. Give me a cigar instead. He takes the, he takes the cigar and starts to walk out. Uh, wait a minute, you didn't pay me for the cigar. Of course not. I traded it against the tobacco plug. Well, I don't recall you paid me for that either. Paid you for it? Why, there it is. None of your tricks on traveling men. There's a neat little double bind there somewhere. <laughs> Unobtrusive, insistent practitioners of the bill were almost always addicts. I wonder if there are any hype men left. Remember Yellow Kid Wild in the big story but set up a whole uh, prop brokerage office? The old-time bank robbers and the burglars who knew what they were looking for and the pickpockets trained from early childhood. The best came from Columbia, they tell me. Where are they now, the Murphy men and the hype artists, the big store? Go on, all gone. Où sont les neiges d'Anton? Noteworthy is the hideously sorted yachting swindle, still practiced. Uh, they're going to uh, buy a boat together and sail the South Seas. This swindle requires that Mark and Swindler live in the same tra trailer, get drunk together every night, and lay the same whore. The yellow kid, wild, would have been scandalized. Never drink with a savage was one of his rules. <clears throat> Well, ordinary outlaws specialize, and so do the nose. Joe the Dead specializes in evolutionary biology. He dedicates his dearly bought knowledge of pain and death to cracking two biologic laws. Law one, hybrids are permitted only between closely related species and then grudgingly. <clears throat> The biologic police bluntly warn to break down the lines that Mother Nature in her right wisdom, I can smell it from here, has established between species is to invite biologic and social chaos. Joe says, what do you think I'm doing here? Let it come down. Rule two, an evolutionary step that involves Biologic mutation is irretrievable and irreversible. Newts start life in the water with gills. At the determined time, the newt sheds his gills and crawls up onto the ordained land, now equipped with air-breathing lungs. The newt then returns to the water where he lives out his days. It might be convenient to reclaim his gills and breathe under water again. No glot clum flighty, says the cosmic uncle. It's the law. <clears throat> so for starters, Joe pulls a baby mule out of the cosmic manger. There is Mary Mother Mule, Mother Mule and John the Father, and the impossible child with a glowing, pulsing halo. Uh, incidentally, the fact that John was a part-time veterinarian might, should we say, illuminate without denying the uh, virgin birth. After all, a sterile syringe is not a corrupt and impure member. <clears throat> so she can still qualify as the Virgin Mary. A Kansas bet known as Joe Lazarus after he was pronounced dead at Lawrence Memorial Hospital having been kicked in the head by a mule, was the instrument of altered destiny. Like St. Paul, knocked off his ass, on his ass, on his way to Damascus, <laughs> Joe Laz, following his miraculous recovery, knew what he had to do. He set out to produce a fertile mule. 
He exposed sperm from his horses and donkeys to orgone and radiation in the magnetized pyramid. Didn't hack it. So Laz went further. He rigged the magnetized manger and bombarded the copulating animals with deadly orgone radiation, D-O-R. And he sewed himself into a goatskin and whipped his beast to wild pan music. Any woman hit by the whip of the goat guard will conceive in nine months. And finally, he created a fertile mule. Skeptics pronounce Joe Laz's mule the most colossal hoax since the virgin birth. <clears throat> I had it up my sleeve, Joe deadpan. <clears throat> a quiet, enigmatic former herpetologist resident in Florida challenges rule two. His name is Joe Sanford. Bitten by a king cobra, he recovered and devoted himself to a study of newts and salamanders. Sanford claims to have reinstituted gills in mature air-breathing newts by injections of a lamb placenta concentrate, the same preparation used, uh, in fact, by Dr. Niehaus of Switzerland to turn back the clock for his wealthy patients, to name a few. This is true now. Somerset Moon, no coward. Pope Pius the Thirteenth, <laughs> President Eisenhower. I recall Eisenhower waving a tiny American flag from his hospital bed with a big stupid grin on his face, and wondering if he would ever die. <laughs> Uh, Winston Churchill couldn't qualify because he couldn't or wouldn't lay off the sauce for six weeks, which is, was a prerequisite for the Niehaus treatment, no exceptions. You will note that Rule 2 carries the implicit assumption that time is irreversible. Sanford made a hole in time, and Joe sloshed through the hybrids. All is in the not done, the diffidence that faltered. Let others quaver out. I dare do all that may become a man who dares do more is none. Not so, says Joe. He who dares at all must dare all. When mules falls, anything goes. When mules glows, anything folds. Hybrids unlimited. Who, who, who? It is not necessary to prove, simply to state. This is a biologic revolution fought with new species and new ways of thinking and feeling. A war where the bullet may take millenniums to hit, like the old joke about the, someone makes a swipe with a razor, you know. Uh, well, miss me that time. Just try and shake your head 300 years from now. <clears throat> This is a uh, Dead Souls. Uh, this is a, um, yeah, from Gogol, of course, a film idea loosely suggested by a sci-fi book called uh, Lost Souls. Uh, Dead Souls postulates that a soul is an electromagnetic field, probably several of them, a, a comp complicated grid, designed to occupy and activate a certain organism. While infinitely less vulnerable than the, artifact, than the artifact it occupies, the soul can be dispersed and destroyed by a nuclear blast. This is, in fact, the sensitive function of the atom bomb, a soul killer. Stacked up, you understand, like cordwood and non-recyclable by the old hellfire like fucking plastics, we have to stay ahead of ourselves and the Ivans, lest some joker endanger national security by braying out, you have souls, you can survive your physical death. Ruins of Hiroshima on screen. Pull back to show technician at a switchboard. Behind him, three middle-aged men in dark suits with a cold, dead look of heavy power. Technician twiddles his knob. All clear. 
Are you sure the technician shrugs the instruments say so? Opie says, thank God it wasn't a dud. Oh, uh, hurry with those printouts, Joe. Yes, sir. He looks at them sourly. Thank Joe it wasn't a dud. God doesn't know what buttons to push. <clears throat> however, however, some tough old souls, horribly maimed and very disgruntled, uh, do survive Hiroshima and come back to endanger national security. So the scientists are put to work to devise a super soul killer. No job too dirty for a fucking scientist. <laughs> Not even the worst of all crimes, soul murder. They start with animals and there are some laboratory accidents. Run for your lives, gentlemen. A purple-ass baboon has survived 23 skadoo. It's the most savage animal on earth. The incandescent baboon soul rips through a steel door like wet paper. Uh, we had to vaporize the installation, lost expensive equipment and personnel, irreplaceable, some of them real soul food chefs, cordon bleu, you might say. <clears throat> There's an interesting detail from the book. Uh, the soul killer gives off a smell of burning plastic and rotten oranges. Anything so bizarrely arbitrary is good enough to steal. I'll be reading some trash sci-fi unspeakable horror book and suddenly I yelp out, gets, 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 good enough to steal. Like that agent shedding his, uh, with a, a laugh like a dry rustling sound like a snake shedding its skin, that's gets. <clears throat> Well, trial and error, we now have soul killers that won't quit. Stay to the fart. Sure the big fart. We know how it's all going to end, the first sound and the last sound. Meanwhile, all personnel on planet Earth can find two quarters. Permanent party, you might say. Uh, convince them they got no souls. It's more humane that way. Scientists always said there is no such thing as a soul, and they are now in a position to prove it. Total death, soul death. It's what the Egyptians call the second and final death. This awesome power to destroy souls forever is now vested in far-sighted and responsible men in the State Department and the CIA. <clears throat> Well, I hesitated to read this piece because uh, not wishing to identify myself with the subject, but I nominate for the most flatly disgusting passages in recent fiction the typical interview between the young intelligence operative and the chief. When Peter walked into the office, the chief smiled. Agents have been known to get frostbite from the chief's smile. Having trouble with a Jew boy? He's a bit standoffish, said Peter, uh, noncommittally. Sure he is. Well, treat a kike like a Jew and treat a high-class Jew like a kike. And he will come back moaning for more. Come on right out with it. You want to get into a nice genteel country club? Well, we like nice Jews with atom bombs and Jew jokes. Ah, uh, Peter could see the could see the chief as some cod eyed old exterminator deciding on the bait to poison a warehouse full of rats, a little molasses, a little tin salmon, plenty of arsenic. Peter knew he was in the presence of greatness. He squirmed with a smaltz of it and broke out fulsomely. I'm just beginning to realize what a cold hearted bastard you are. The chief was pleased. He couldn't help squirming a little, but his voice was cool. Well, that's one way of looking at it. I call it staying on top of an aunt. The casualties could run into the millions. The billions, Peter, the billions. 
The chief spread his hands and smiled. Outsiders, none of our people will be touched. Operation Bunker. Hello. Long enough for things to cool down, then we emerge like the phoenix. Without, of course, the inconvenience of being burned. <clears throat> Just drop a few hints. Room in the bunker for the right kind of Jew. You know what I mean, white Jews. None of that Galatian trash. Now, they tell me Portuguese Jews is the best kind, like Portuguese oysters. Peter squirmed deliciously. This was true greatness. You can't fake the real thing. You are a cold-hearted bastard, he ejaculated, white out and back. He's coming around, Chief, just like you said he would, suddenly out of a clear sky, he says. It's the kikes in our race that give us a bad name. Any trouble with a cracker, boy? Not a peep. I gave him the old right smalls right down the line like you told me. What are you doing over there with the niggers and the apes? Why don't you come over here where you belong and act like a white man? <clears throat> huh? Always a place in the bunker for the right kind of darky, huh? <clears throat> he swallowed that, did he? I thought he would. Believes in the American dream like all niggers. Well, as one menstruating cunt said to another, I guess it's in the rag, Mary. The chief smiles slow and dirty. <clears throat>I've been reading a lot of these doctor books lately. Yeah, my doctor, Fenway, really shines forth as a model of responsibility and competence <laughs> by comparison. Perhaps the most distasteful book of this genre is entitled A Pride of Healers. Uh, it's to be to remember there's pathology. Who decides, well, patients got cancer or don't got it? The doctors open up, and anything suspicious, they send a hunk down to pathology, and then they stand around, twiddle their scaffolds, and wait. <laughs> Get a green light. It's malignant, boys. Let's go. <clears throat> <laughs> so in this pride of prowling healers, the runty, ugly, half-impotent pathologist finds a big surgeon humping his old lady. So he carefully frames the adulterous surgeon for prostate cancer, falsifying the results. And everybody knows there is only one answer to that. The surgeon is castrated, and his nuts sent down to pathology. Holding the nuts of his enemy in his hand gets him aroused, and he surprises his wife by a real pimp fuck. She's got another, another surprise for her. As she comes, he shoves the severed nuts down her throat. <clears throat> As the Germans say, un appetitlich, un appetit. <laughs> and most of them aren't quite like, as lurid as that, just ordinary, no good, greedy, callous, bigoted humans with a grossly inflated self-image. Here is Mike Sadens from Final Diagnosis. Attractive, red-haired, empty as an empty waiting room. Well, how can anyone believe in God or ESP or anything like that in the face of these vast medical complexes, monuments of progress and science and rationality and healing? Uh, this wretched specimen has fallen for a 19-year-old nurse. He fucked her in a broom closet to a reek of Mr. Clean. <clears throat> He is proposed. She is accepted. Then she comes down with a bone cancer. They have to take off her left leg. Her left leg stat. Scapel's crossed. It hasn't spread. Does he still want her? She tells him to take five days and think it over. He does. With bleak clarity, he sees the years to come. Oh, yes, he can see where his own interests are involved. He is striding towards surgery, big man on complex now. It takes guts to practice surgery, he says. Boy, it sure does. <clears throat> they do without him. Striding towards surgery, though the patient is clearly terminal, he would operate on a mummy. And she is shamming along on her prosthetic. Will you shake the lead out? I'm doing the best I can, darling. 
Why don't you go back to her crutches, he thinks irritably aloud, he says. Why don't you jet propel on your stinking farts? <clears throat> Admittedly, his words were somewhat unkind. <clears throat> but cancer does stink. Of course, it's not her fault she is in this loathsome condition, or is it? His mother always said, Son, in this life, everyone gets exactly what they want and exactly what they deserve. Uh, people who are getting what they think they deserve tend to believe it. <clears throat> uh, another flash. In Congress, Lee Mike thinks of an old joke. The eternal traveling salesman, protagonist to the eternal dirty joke. Salesman spots an attractive woman in the club car. As fate would have it, she is in the lower berth just opposite his upper berth, and he is eyeballing her. She pops out a glass eye. She takes off her wig. She spits out her false teeth. She unhooks her wooden legs. Looks up at him pertly and says, Anything you want? <clears throat> you know what I want. Take it off and throw it up here. <clears throat> He starts laughing, she demands why, and finally he tells her, and she hits him with her prostatic, requiring five stitches. <clears throat> uh, look, darling, I've been thinking it over and, uh, she throws an ashtray at him. <clears throat> the medical riots of uh, 1999. It is estimated that 10,000 doctors, medical bureaucrats, Directors of pharmaceutical companies were massacred in the week of the long scapples. The killings were not by any means random. The rioters had lists. There's the bastard let me pass a kidney stone in the emergency room. <clears throat> it stacked up and up. Unnecessary operations, patients dying in the emergency room. We cannot accept medical admissions from emergency. Ambulance calls disregarded. I can't send an ambulance unless I know what is wrong with her. She's having a heart attack. I can't send an ambulance unless I know what's wrong with her. She's having a coronary. I can't send an ambulance. Potentially beneficial and harmless products and treatments kept off the market. Lethal products kept on the market. A recent example is the, are the so-called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for arthritis. Don't ever let any doctor talk you into using them. I took one pill, one pill. I've never been as sick in my life. In England, eight people died of liver failure caused by this shit. And still, they won't withdraw it, just change the trade name. I saw a TV show where the company representative, the lies just oozing and slithering out of him, tried to tell a woman her hepatitis could have come from some other cause. <clears throat> I know it was that medicine. And I know a, a nurse who got hepatitis from this stuff. Well, it was the burn unit walkout that set off the riots. I have this from nurses who have worked in burn units. Absolutely no morphine or other painkillers are ordered for the patients. Otherwise, there could be a danger of addiction for patients may, who may be in treatment for months. Even the dying are denied morphine if they have the misfortune to die in the burn unit. But doctor, my nurse informant protests, uh, the patient will be dead in 12 hours. Don't you think I know that? This is a burn unit. We are under burn unit rule. His hands are securely tied by 200,000 a year. Everyday burn unit patients have the raw cavity scrubbed out with a stiff brush to clear away dead skin and flesh. The patients scream with agony, and very few nurses can take it. Well, a team of, am of amateur astronauts who call themselves the Spacers landed in the burn unit when their, home when their homemade rocket space rocket exploded. <clears throat> After the first scrub out, they issued an ultimatum. Morphine every four hours, as long as we need it, we walk out. What is this nonsense? There will be no morphine and you're not going anywhere. Uh, meet my brother, the lawyer, doctor. <clears throat> you propose to hold these people against their will? 
It's for their own good. If they leave the hospital, they'll be dead in a few days from infections. They set up a private clinic in a loft. Clashed with police raiders searching for narcotics. Three patients shot to death. The walkout spreads like a topping forest fire. Morphine or walk. Mow, mow, mow. <laughs> the doctors paw the ground uneasily like cattle scenting danger. In 17th century London, everybody got fed up to the mouth of the lawyers. And the cry went up, kill all the bloody lawyers. Whereupon, even the most elderly and infirm scrambled off with the agility of rats or evil spirits. <clears throat> Hampered by inflated self-image, the healers did not acquit themselves as well. What are we waiting for, a hospital bed? Kill all the fucking croakers. Security steps nimbly aside and the crowds rush in. Got a hot shot cutting doc here. I think he needs an operation. <laughs> Hell yes, a gutectomy. <clears throat> Paging Dr. Stroylenschnitt. That's not sloppy cut. <clears throat> Enter Dr. Stroylenschnitt, attended by his scalpel bearers carrying two foot knives and saws. You is filled up with unnecessitated parts. Two kidneys, sure, bun is a Jew. Rashmet. The inner parts should not be so close in together crowded. They need Laban's round like their Futterland. <laughs> uh, well, I will turn now to the chat book. Yes, uh, the title is The Cat Inside. Uh, May 4th, 1985, I am packing for a short trip to New York to discuss the cat book with Brian Geisen, who is going to do the illustrations. In the front room where the kittens are kept, Calico Joan is nursing one black kitten, a little calico cat. She had five kittens. I pick up my tourister. It seems heavy. I look inside, and there are four kittens. Take care of my babies. Take them with you wherever you go. <clears throat> oh, here we are, yes. I'm selecting cat food at the pet shop in Dillon's, and I meet an old woman. Seems her cats won't eat any cat food with fish in it. Well, I tell her mine are just the opposite. They prefer the fishy foods like salmon dinner and seafood supper. Well, she says they certainly are company. And what can she do for her company when there is no Dillon's and no pet shop? What can I do? What can I do? I simply couldn't stand to see my cats hungry. Well, uh, there, of course, there are many, uh, many wild cats, some of them that could be tamed, uh, cats that weigh only three pounds. However, there will be fewer and fewer exotic, beautiful animals. <coughs> uh, the, the rainforests of Borneo and South America are going to make way for what? At Los Alamos Ranch School, where they later made the atom bomb and couldn't wait to drop it on the evil east, the yellow peril, the boys are sitting on logs and rocks eating some sort of food. Uh, there is a stream at the end of a slope. The counselor was a southerner with a politician look about him. Like many southerners, he was a natural orator, just naturally full of bullshit. He told us stories by the campfire culled from the racist garbage of the insidious Sax Romer. You remember Sax Romer, who created the insidious Dr. Fu Manchu, Hirsch Yellow Peril? And Fu Manchu went on and on like Tarzan. You thought he was dead, and then he'd pop up again. He also wrote books about evil Egyptians, the green eyes of Bast, the unspeakable Antony Ferrara, well, Tony looked more like a beautiful, evil woman than a man, up to his crotch in unspeakable rites and depraved practices, 
and secrets so foul no decent man may learn them and live. Basic postulate. East is cruel, depraved, devious, immoral, antichrist, anti-American, in a word, evil. West is humane, decent, wholesome, straightforward, moral, sincere, and God-fearing, in a word, good. Good for what, exactly? <laughs> Suddenly a badger erupts among the boys. I <clears throat> don't know why he did it, just playful, friendly, and inexperienced, like the Indians who brought fruit down to the Spanish and got their hands cut off. Uh, so the counselor rushes for his saddlebag and gets out his 1912 Colt 45 auto and starts blasting at the badger, missing him with every shot at six feet. Finally, he puts his gun three inches from the badger's side and shoots. This time, the badger rolls down the slope into the stream. I can see the stricken animal, the sad, shrinking face, rolling down the slope, bleeding, dying. You see an animal, you kill it, don't you? It might have bitten one of the boys. This book is about interspecies contact, not interspecies communication. There is a basic difference between communication and contact. Communication is designed to avoid contact, to maintain a distance across which communication can take place. Contact involves identification with a creature you contact, and this can be very painful. Communication can be forced. Can contact cannot. You cannot force anyone to feel. Uh, this cat book recounts my own experiences with interspecies contact. You know when it happens, it can't be faked. And in this case, of course, contacting the badger is very painful indeed. He just wanted to romp and play and get shot to the 45. <clears throat> Identify with that, feel that, contact that. I don't know how many of you saw the TV short on Bigfoot. Uh, tracks and sightings in the Northwest Mountain area, interviews with local inhabitants. Uh, here's a 300-pound female slob. Uh, what, in your opinion, should be done about these creatures if they exist? A dark shadow crosses her ugly face and her eyes shine with conviction. Kill them. They might hurt somebody. A specimen of homo sap on screen with a long-range rifle and telescopic sights. Close-cropped beard, trying to look like an adventurer and looking like a marginal freelance journalist who writes for survival. He is quite sure big feet are out there in those hills and proposes to kill a specimen. If I lived in the area, I would be more worried about this jerk with his rifle than about Bigfoot. <laughs> but I suspect Bigfoot to be a fake like the Barnum and Bailey unicorn. <clears throat> uh, well, a camera team uh, just happens on Bigfoot with their cameras all set up and ready to go. Lights, action, camera. There he is, about a hundred yards away, walking with a strange slow gait, taking six feet at a stride like a moonwalk. Uh, scientific stride experts say this is not a human stride. Well, certainly not at 24 frames per second. I suspect it to be a man in a gorilla suit projected in slow motion. When I was four years old, I saw a vision in Forest Park, St. Louis. Uh, my brother was ahead of me with an air rifle. I was lagging behind, and I saw a little green reindeer about the size of a cat, clear and precise in the late afternoon sunlight as if seen through a telescope. Well, can those images, those visions be photographed? Certainly. Anything that can be seen can be photographed and anything that can be photographed can be faked. The magical me medium is being bulldozed away, no more green reindeer in Forest Park. Angels are leaving all the alcoves everywhere. The medium in which unicorns, Bigfoot, 
green deer exist, always thinner like the rainforests and the creatures that live and breathe in them, as the forests fall to make way for motels and Hiltons, the whole magical universe is dying. Well, life such as it is goes on. Dylan's is still open. I am the cat who walks alone. To me, all supermarkets are alike. <clears throat> uh, this is the end. We are the cats inside. We are the cats who cannot walk alone, and for us, there is only one place. Walk alone for us. Thank you. program every man of God. And how can this be accomplished? Well, to put it country simple, by doing your job and doing it well. Because there are many gods. A god, god of whores and thieves and pushers. A god of fevers and plagues who rides on a whispering south wind. A god of the long chance. The horse that comes from last to win in the stretch the punch-drunk fighter who comes off the floor to win by a knockout, a god of anti-heroes and outrage, the ship's captain who put on women's clothes and rushed into the first lifeboat, the piler who bailed out of a burning plane, leaving his passengers to crash, a god of future space travelers who are ready to leave the whole human context behind and take a step into the unknown. Every man a god, that is, if he can qualify. You can't be a god of anything unless you can do it. Thank you. An English cat hater of the upper classes, he became a lord in course of time, I hear. Well, this limey son of a bitch confided to me he had trained a dog to break a cat's back with one shake. And I remember he caught sight of a cat at a party and snarled out through his long yellow horse teeth that crowded out of his mouth. Nasty, stinking little beast. Well, I didn't know anything about cats at the time. Now I would get up from my chair and say, Pardon me, old thing, if I toddle along, but there's a nasty, stinking big beast here. I will take this occasion to denounce the vile English practice of riding to hounds so the sodden huntsman can watch a beautiful, delicate fox torn to pieces by their stinking dogs. Heartened by this loudish spectacle, they repair to the manor house to get drunker than they already are. No better than their filthy, fawning, shit-eating, carrion-rolling, baby-killing beasts. Warning to all young couples who are expecting a blessed event. Get rid of that family dog. What are fluffy harm a child? Why, that's ridiculous. Long may your child live to think so, little mother. <clears throat> Fondly dawdling their child and drooling baby talk when Fluffy, in a jealous rage, rushes on the baby, bites through its skull, and kills it. That's an actual case, and there are many. I, a very quite recent one, jealousy caused dog to kill my child. Small dog, too. It was a Scottish terrier. You know, the dogs are the only 
animal other than man with a knowledge of right and wrong, so Fluffy knows what to expect when he is dragged whimpering from under the bed where he cowers. He realizes the full extent of his trespass. No other animal would make the connection. And dogs are the only self-righteous animal. And another horrible practice, walking to hogs. Here are Clem and Cash down in the Everglades of Florida. Get their jollies killing wild hogs with their knives. Jump on the hog's back and cut its throat. But they couldn't indulge their loudish pastime without a pack of 30 yipping, yelping hounds to distract and immobilize the pigs. When your hounds bay a stand of pigs, you gotta get there fast because a hog's tusk can open up a dog like a surgeon's scalpel. And sometimes you arrive too late. It brings tears to the eyes to see a courageous dog half gutted out coming back for more. To whose eyes does this bring tears, you bestial redneck? Pigs out there minding their own business, living on roots and berries, and out charges clam and cash and their horrible hounds. <laughs> I have eulogized the fennec fox, a creature so delicate and timorous in the wild state that he dies of fright if touched by human hands. The red fox, the silver fox, the bat-eared fox of Africa, all beautiful animals. Wolves and coyotes in the wild condition are quite acceptable. What went so hideously wrong with a domestic dog? Man molded the domestic dog in his own worst image. Self-righteous is a lynch mob, servile and vicious, replete with the vilest coprophagic perversions. And what other animal tries to fuck your leg? <laughs> <laughs> I am not a dog hater. I do hate what man has made of his best friend. The snarl of a panther is certainly more dangerous than the snarl of a dog, but it isn't ugly because a cat's rage is his own, beautiful. Uh, all his hair standing up and crackling with blue sparks, eyes blazing and sputtering, but a dog's snarl is ugly, a redneck lynch, mag, lynch mob parky basher snarl. Snarl if someone got a kill it queer for a Christ sticker on his heat. A self-righteous, occupied snarl. When you see that snarl, you are looking at something that has no face of its own. A dog's rage is not his. It's dictated by his trainer, and the lynch mob is dictated by their uh, horrible conditioning. Cats. Cats were held in veneration by the ancient Egyptians. To harm a cat was a crap capital crime. Here's a newspaper article. A man in uh, Warwick, Rhode Island, was fined $200 for killing a stray cat in his microwave oven. A case that screams for Egyptian justice. <clears throat> <laughs> Dogs, of course, started as sentinels, and that's still their chief function in farms and village in farm and village to give notice of approach. As hunters and guards, and that is why they hate cats. Look at the services we provide, and all cats do is loll around and purr ratters are they. It takes a cat half an hour to kill a mouse. All cats do is purr and eighty-eight the master's affection for my honest shit eating face. <clears throat> The cat does not offer services, the cat offers itself. Of course, he wants care and shelter, you don't buy love for nothing. Like all pure creatures, cats are practical.